Welcome to the Freight Farms tour of the Greenery S. Uh, what I'm standing in right now is the newest model uh, from Freight Farms called the Greenery S. It is a soup to nuts controlled environment agriculture solution. And what we grow in here are a, there's really no limit to the number of plant or the, the kinds of plants that you can grow in this machine. Uh, but I'm gonna give you a tour today. I'm gonna take you through the life cycle of a plant. I'm also gonna explain the equipment in the farm to you and just kind of give you a little bit of a taste of what it's like to be a freight farmer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Where I'm standing right now is in the, what we call the nursery area of the freight farm. So behind me here, we have the door. Behind me here is the seedling table. So this is where all of our seedlings start in these little plugs. I'm gonna show you a close up here in a second. And then behind me is the cultivation area. And that is where the plants will spend the rest of their lives after being transplanted. So this entire container here is 40 feet long. It is eight feet wide, nine and a half feet tall, and it is fully insulated. It has an insulation value of approximately R28. So very well insulated container, really designed for any type of environment that you wanna grow in. It will maintain the conditions inside of this container, the environmental conditions very, very well, despite outside temperatures um, and extreme um, kind of weather conditions. So let's get into it. Right here is the seedling table. So this seedling table was redesigned for the Greenery S. Um, there are quite a few things that you're going to notice here if you've seen a previous version of the greenery um, but it does have a lot of the same features as well so all of our seedlings start in a little peat moss plug so this right here is an oak leaf variety I'll show you that and it was planted on the 14th of january so these seedlings have been here for approximately two weeks and we'll pull one of these out give you a quick look at it and this is what a rooted seedling will look like after approximately two weeks in this plug. So we'll put a seed manually into each one of these little plugs. And over time, you can see they start to grow a little root mass there and some foliage on top. So this oak leaf variety will spend about seven weeks in this farm from seed all the way through harvest. Now in the back here, we've got some more interesting plants. This one is a uh, German winter thyme. So different types of plants are gonna sprout and grow at different rates. Um, this time here, I'll be gentle with it, as you can see has been growing for about the same amount of time, but is a much smaller plant. So that's the benefit of this type of system is that you can grow any variety of plants. You can see over here, we've got this tray of beautiful lettuce um, and you can grow all of this in the same environment and in the same system. So. This system here is an ebb and flow system, which means that it is wa bottom watered. So we flood and drain these troughs roughly every eight hours. So the water comes in, it fills up, it bottom waters these plugs here, it then drains out on a regular cycle. All of this is completely automated. We use a controller, a uh, actually a proprietary controller in our containers here that we've built and designed ourselves and is incredibly intelligent. So it knows when to time, um, it knows how long to fill for it, You can customize all of the lighting and watering arrangements. You can customize the pH, the EC or the nutrient concentration of your water. All, all of this is fully customizable, but if you're not interested in that and you really just want a simple solution. There are also recipes that we provide, which are a simple one click solution and will set your farm to the settings necessary to grow a specific crop. So, as you can see, lettuce is one of our favorite crops in here. Um, and we're going to talk about the rest of the life cycle after the plant has spent its time here in the seedling area. So at about three weeks, plants are a little bit bigger than these here. So once again, these are only about two weeks old. They've got probably five to six more days left in this seedling area before they're going to be transplanted. We will then transplant them into the cultivation area. So this cultivation area is made up of four grow walls. There are two mobile walls and the grow walls are on both sides. So as you can see over here, we have our most mature lettuces. And then as you make your way across the walls, we've got younger and younger lettuces. So the way that 
we normally will plant a farm is we'll stagger the planting so that each week you have a consistent amount of produce to harvest. So over here, as I mentioned, these are the oldest. So these are about four weeks in the panel. So um, about 49 days from seed coming up on this Thursday. Over here, these are our three week lettuces. So they're about a week younger. Then we have our two week here on this wall. And then over here we have our one week lettuces. So by staggering them this way, we can basically guarantee and project very easily and accurately what our yields are going to be for that week and what we will have to provide. Um, so if you're a farmer and you're looking for a very predictive crop model, this is a really easy way to do that. And these four walls, we generally will divide the farm into four sections and we will plant each wall by the weeks. So this would be week two, like I said, week three, and then on the other side, week four. And each week you're just harvesting one wall and then transplanting plants in its place. So frequently we'll get questions about spacing, plant spacing, um, and just kind of crop timing. How do we go about doing that? So we've done a lot of research internally here to basically figure out what is the maximum density that we can plant these plants at to maximize the, the growth rate, but also to give them enough room to grow out to a sizable or a, a marketable size. So I'm gonna give you an example here with this panel. I'm gonna take it down. So this is a panel of red oak leaf lettuce. Uh, this particular variety is known as Rusai. It's a really beautiful lettuce from Johnny Seeds. Uh, they're one of the our favorite seed partners that we work with. So what we have planted here, you can see we've used channels one, three, and five. This is a five channel panel. And you can see that these two inner channels here are actually empty. There's nothing growing in them. We want these to be open so that these plants can grow into that space. So they have enough space to grow into and really maximize their growth and um, size. So we planted these at approximately 45 plants per panel. So 15 in channels one, three, and five. And as you can see, we've offset them. So we're gonna plant these in roughly the same location. And then this one in the middle, we're gonna offset it a couple inches to the bottom or to the top. And that maximizes the amount of space that they have to grow into. So we do that for all of our different lettuces. I'll back this up so you can kind of see what the, the density looks like. So once again, this is our red oak leaf. All right. And we'll do that with every other type of crop that we grow in here as well. So you can see the red oak leaf is a slightly smaller lettuce variety. We also have the green butterhead over here, which is a classic. A lot of people are familiar with this one. Um, and then we also have your leaf lettuces, which you can see grow a lot faster. It's just a varietal difference. Um, genetically, they are just a different type of plant, but they are all lettuces. So we've got a leaf lettuce here. We've got our romaine, which you can see that's just a wall of romaine right there. And then these are called a sweet crisp lettuce. So each type of plant grows a little bit differently. The speed that it grows at, the amount of space it needs, um, all of that are a little bit specific to each plant, but we've found the happy medium for all of these to grow. And that is the spacing that we'll use here. Now, all lettuces roughly need the same, have the same nutritional needs. So what we have done is we've built our nutrient tanks here into the end of our seedling table. Each one of these nutrient tanks can hold a different nutrient part. So let's say you're using a two part nutrient, a nutrient A and a nutrient B. Those would go in two of these containers and then you might have a pH down to control your pH, which is gonna go in here. Now, all of this is connected to the controller, which is the brain of the farm. And that controller has certain rules. Those rules will basically determine what that nutrient concentration is, what that target pH is. And then there are sensors within this cabinet as well, which are reading those, apologies which are reading those readings constantly. So you can see those three sensors right there. We have a pH sensor, we have an EC sensor in the middle, and then we have a water temperature sensor built into that EC sensor as well. 
So we're taking those readings 24 seven. And every time one of those readings comes through, the controller is deciding whether or not that reading is in line with the target values that you've set. And once again, these are completely customizable, but if you just want a simple grab and go solution, there's a button you can push, it will set it to a recipe, and then it will follow the instructions in that recipe. So for example, if your pH is set to six and your pH rises to let's say 6.2 over time, the system will automatically detect that and it will add pH down to your water to lower it automatically. This is all done without input from you, the farmer. This is automated and all you have to do is make sure that your tanks stay full. There are also sensors in the tank that tell you if that sensor, tell you if that tank is low. Um, a lot of really cool, simple technology that we've built into this to just make the farmer's life that much easier and to help spend less time thinking about refilling consumables and more time about growing your business. So I'll take you to the back of the farm too. Um, I may not get great internet reception back there. So if I do lose you for a second, I will come back to the front. Just hang in there for just a second, but I'll walk you down what I call the aisle of lettuce. So as I mentioned, these rows here are mobile. So this is our mobile LED rack in the middle. I'll turn on those lights for you in a second and show you the colors. But each one of these grow rows is made up of 22 panels. So as I go down, you can see that almost all of these are full. Getting to the end, 22. Once you get to the end, you have a false wall here. We have an HVAC system behind this wall that is capable of cooling the entire farm, removing the heat that is produced by the LEDs. We also have reclaimed condensate here. So all the water that the AC is pulling out of the air is being recycled. It's being brought right back into our main tank, which lives here on the floor. So all of that water that's being pulled out of the air that the plants are transpiring as they grow, it's being recaptured and added right back to our tank. This is what allows us to use so little water in this system. The freight farm can use usually around five gallons of water a day, which is honestly about 99% less than conventional agriculture. Sounds like a big number, but it's actually true. So five gallons of water a day in some places where humidity is high, we actually have farms that are water positive, meaning that they produce or they pull more water out of the air than the plants transpire, that the plants use. And that means that their tanks are actually full all the time. So we've got a number of different pumps in here. We've got an RO filter system here. So this is how we filter our water as it comes in. This isn't a requirement, <clears throat> but it is necessary for some locations, depending on how hard your water is, if you use a well source, et cetera. And then up here, we have a small low voltage electrical box. That's where the brain of the farm is gonna live. It also uh, holds the router that connects your farm to the internet. Your farm being connected to the internet is one of the coolest features and it allows you to um, basically access this entire suite of extra features and uh, really cool software products that we've built to support our farmers. You do not have to, however, if your farm, if you do not have an internet connection available or you want to be completely off grid, your farm can run completely disconnected from the internet. You can still run, operate and program your farm but that additional internet access allows you to collect all of your data, look at that over time, and also allows you to use all those other cool software features that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So once again, we'll walk back through the aisle of lettuce. Give you a quick look here. In case you're wondering, everything that we grow in this farm is for research purposes. We actually don't sell any of this lettuce here. So everything that you see is currently in one of our trials that we're running here to basically always try and push the limits of what this farm can do and pass that knowledge along to you, the farmer, so that you can get more out of your farm and uh, everybody likes that. So let's see, one other sneak peek here. Don't show this to everybody, so you're very lucky. But in addition to the lettuce that we grow in this farm and the other leafy greens, we also grow some cool experimental crops. So just to kind of give you an idea of some of the cool things that you can grow, these right here are hops. 
So these are vining hops. We basically wound these. We've planted them from the bottom, grown all the way up to the top of the tower. That's a full seven feet tall. And then we've actually started winding it back down. So we will continue to grow these vines until they have basically pulled out this entire panel and then we will flower them. And for any of you that know hops, the flowers are what you use in beer. And uh, once we have those, I'll make sure to let you know whatever beer we decide to make with it. And then down here, these are a really, really experimental crop. These are actually mini watermelons. So first time growing them in a freight farm, but we will let you know what we find. We'll probably end up rigging up some kind of hammock down here just to hold those watermelons as they grow and develop. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of the breadth of crops that you can grow inside one of these containers. It is not in any way an exhaustive list. We have had some really amazing crops grown in these farms, um, some really experimental stuff, as well as some things that you would expect like arugula and spinach and bok choy and all of the other leafy greens that you probably known to know and come to know and love. So this is the Greenery S and I am more than happy to take questions and um, really just fill in any of the gaps that I missed here. All righty. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy. I'm the Community Engagement and Events Coordinator here at Freight Farms. Um, like Dave said, we have plenty of time to answer as many questions as we can. So please feel free to submit them in the Q&A feature. If we aren't able to get to them during the live event today, we will be able to follow up with you afterwards. Unfortunately, if you submit them through the chat feature, it doesn't always carry over onto Zoom. So we wanna make sure that you get all the um, answers to your questions. Just to start off right from the beginning, I wanted to cover cost and um, international units. So if you, because we get a few questions about that. Um, the cost of the Greenery S MSRP is 149,000. However, we are running a promotion that ends at the end of March. So I would highly recommend reaching out to your account executive to learn more about that if you're uh, really interested in purchasing a Greenery S. If you don't know who your account executive is, don't worry about that. When we send out the recording, it'll have a link to their email address where you can contact them directly. And then also on international units, we have gotten a few questions about that. Just reach out to your account executive again on that. They'll be able to provide you with uh, more specifics on those details. All right, Dave, as always, we have a ton of questions. So before we get started, Amy, can I turn on the lights really quickly? I forgot to do that. And that's yeah, that would be great. Always forget. All right. So here we go. Right. So very brief introduction to the grow lights behind us. We use red and blue wavelength LEDs uh, to grow our plants. Red and blue are the most efficient wavelengths in the light in the visible light spectrum that plants absorb uh, in their chlorophyll. They do absorb light from other wavelengths as well, but research has shown that blue and red are the most efficiently absorbed. So this allows us to minimize the cost of actually running these and maximize the amount of energy that the plants are able to absorb and utilize from the plant, from the light energy that we decide to use. So there are the lights. They are very, very powerful. And I definitely do not recommend looking at them directly when you're in here. So I'm going to turn those off. All right, Amy. Awesome. So we've gotten a few questions about the nursery station water tank and the sure. nutrients and everything like that. So can you just explain there was, you showed four tube looking things and people are wondering if you can kind of explain that more in depth and also like specifically what's in those and how that system works. Absolutely. So the one thing I didn't show you was the seedling tank, which is here on the other side of this seedling table. So it's about 11 feet long. As we saw over there, that is the dosing cabinet area. So that's where the nutrients are stored. And then over here, we actually have the tank for the seedling area. So this is about 40 gallons. And these tanks, that tank right there that you saw, as well as the main tank, which was the metal box that you saw in the rear of the farm, 
are maintained separately. So the nutrient levels and the pH, um, as well as the temperature actually are maintained separately. And those are controlled by different dosing systems. So within those nutrient tanks, just to kind of walk you through how this works, within each one of these nutrient tanks, as I mentioned, you might have a nutrient A, a nutrient B, a pH down, and then you've got a spare tank here in case you want to use um, a bacterial additive, a beneficial bacteria, or potentially a cleaning solution, something that you want to keep in here for more regular dosing. What would happen is your sensors here, as I mentioned, you have your EC sensor and your pH sensor. Water is constantly running over these sensors. So you can see you have two sets. One of these is for the seedling tank. There's just a pump in there that's pushing water over these sensors continuously. You have a separate pump in the main tank that's doing the same thing. As these sensors read the water, if, that, if those parameters, the pH or the EC, fall out of line or get too far away from your target values, the farm automatically knows to start dosing nutrients from these tubes here. So if your nutrient levels get too low, it will run these little dosing pumps here built into the side of the dosing cabinet. This pump will turn, it will draw nutrients out of that nutrient tank and put it into this line, which is just full of water that is being pushed from that seedling tank over these little inputs here and then back to the seedling tank. So if you need more nutrients, Nutrient A will run, it'll wait, and then nutrient B will run, it'll wait. And if that EC is still low, it will run that cycle again after about 10 minutes. So it's a very intelligent system and it knows when and when not to add nutrients. And that is the, that is the way it's designed is to allow you the maximum amount of control and also to automate it to the greatest degree possible. Awesome. And you spent a little bit, of, or you quick briefly mentioned um, the water being recycled back in and hard water. Can you just explain a little bit more about the different types of water that may be acceptable to use in your farm? And if you do have hard water, what should you do? Can you use rainwater? Absolutely. So for most people, they're using municipal water as their water source. Um, you can certainly use municipal water, you can use well water, you can use rain water. The cleaner your water is, and when I say cleaner, what I mean is the fewer nutrients or minerals that are in your water, the easier it is to control the nutrients that are in there in the long run. So if you start out with very clean water with almost no nutrients in it, the only nutrients that will ever be in your water are what you add to the water. So it is highly recommended that if you have, and we have certain thresholds and recommendations that we can provide you, but if you have a certain amount of nutrients or minerals that are naturally present in your water source, we recommend that you filter it. That way you're removing a lot of those and you're removing a variable from your growing experience. So um, it allows you then to control what nutrients you put back in the water. Nutrient ratios are very, very important in hydroponics. You wanna make sure that you have the right amount of each nutrient and that will help maximize your growth. Um, so is it possible to use any water source? Absolutely. If you are going to use a municipal water source or a well water source, we recommend that you get your water tested. We'll review that with you. We'll let you know whether or not we recommend that you filter it. And then if you do wanna filter it, we can recommend a system to add that will help you clear it out in the most efficient way possible and get you the best results. So we do this for all of our customers, anyone who's interested. Uh, it's a free consultation service and we will definitely help you figure out how to get the cleanest water possible into your farm. Yes, absolutely. And speaking or staying on the water subject, can you spend some time talking about the vertical irrigation drip system? Yes, that's uh, one of the key features that I did not mention here, apologies <laughs> for that. but. What you see here are these hanging panels here. So as I said, there are 22 on each side. Above each one of these channels is a little drip emitter. You can kind of see that emitter right there. So this is a pressure compensating drip emitter, which means that it has a little diaphragm inside and that will basically regulate the flow of water through that emitter. So we have a pump living in that main tank back there. It is going to pump water through a pipe, down 
through this pipe here above our heads. And then the water comes out of each one of these individual emitters and waters all the plants in each one of these channels. Within each one of these channels right here is something called a saturation strip. So I'll kind of give you a quick look at it. You can kind of see it in there. That saturation strip is just a polyester and cotton blend. It is a fabric that is extremely absorbent. So all that's meant to do is provide a place, a, basically a water delivery system to the roots of the plants. The roots of the plants will actually grow into that saturation strip as well. And that is where they absorb their nutrients from. So full flow, the full kind of flow of the water, it comes from that tank, goes up through that line, comes down, drips through each one of these individual emitters here, feeds all of the plants in the channel. Any excess water drips out the bottom of the channel into this gutter here, and then runs back to the main tank where it's recycled and recaptured. So that's what allows it to be so water efficient is that we are constantly basically recapturing any water that is not actively being uptaken by the plants. Awesome. And of course, a hot topic is crops and plants and all that you can grow. As everyone can see, we have a lot of lettuce in our farm. You mentioned hops. What else can you grow? What are some things that maybe our farmers are growing that may be a little bit different than leafy greens? I know I've mentioned um, one of our farmers loves turnips and radishes. Yeah. Root crops are very popular. So like you mentioned, radishes, turnips. Um, we have grown beets before, but they don't form the same bulb, or at least not as quickly as they would um, in some other systems. So they do form amazing beet grains, and we've used those before. So a lot of different root crops, a lot of herbs. Herbs are very popular uh, among our farmers. So we have basil, thyme, oregano, sage, rosemary, etc. Those are, are very kind of common staples. Um, also the Parsley and um, cilantro are another two very popular ones. A lot of times farmers are growing specialty crops too, like a red vein sorrel, um, you know, so anything that can be used as a garnish or something that has an extremely tart flavor to it, something like uh, wasabi arugula or a mustard green, those are very popular as well. You can also grow really hearty leafy greens like chard or collards, uh, also pretty common, pretty common. Kale fits in that category as well. And then you start to get into some really interesting ones like flowers. We grew an entire farm of calendula, which is uh, a flower that's often used in uh, cosmetics, which is what we were actually growing it for. So that was a, a really interesting experience. Very, very beautiful, but those are some very, very bushy, big plants. Um, so that was, that was really fun. And then of course, as far as your fruiting crops go, we have had farmers grow things like strawberries, tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. But they're really not, when it comes down to it, what most of our farmers are growing is what's economically viable. Meaning if it takes up space in the panel, it has to pay itself off over time. And how's that gonna affect my ROI? So can they be grown? 1000%. In fact, we've grown a lot of these really experimental crops right here in our HQ farm as well as have lots of farmers who are growing them out there in the world, but they tend not to be the best bang for your buck. And so they're not particularly popular. And so, <clears throat> as I mentioned, things like berries or tomatoes are kind of in that category where they're great luxury crops. And if you can get the right price per pound for them, they may make economic sense. But in the, I'd say for the vast majority of our farmers, leafy greens tend to be the more profitable crop and that's why people gravitate towards them. Awesome. And for someone who is interested in purchasing this and they love healthy food and veggies, how would you, but they know nothing about hydroponic or vertical farming, how would I learn about this once I purchase it? What about training? What do we offer? Well, first I got to say, hop on in. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Um, hydroponics seems like a very daunting subject to a lot of people. Um, and it can be, there's a lot to learn, but what we've done when we built this farm, we built it very purposefully to try and make it easy for people to work in. We wanted to make it simple. We wanted to take a lot of the guesswork out of it. And that's what that automated dosing system does. That's what the recipes that I mentioned do. 
Um, a lot of that is meant to make this experience easier. We also have a really robust and active online community. So these are farmers across the world that are talking to each other. They're sharing information. Um, you know, they're sharing obstacles that they've faced. They're, they're sharing failures that they've had. And that is all just to make the community stronger. It's to help other people avoid those same pitfalls. Um, we also have a really talented CS team. So those CS means client services here. We do provide training as a part of uh, the purchase, which it is additional, but it is something that we highly recommend because it is really, really helpful and comprehensive and helps you understand how to operate your farm and how to get the most out of it. And also covers things like maintenance so that you know how to keep your farm growing for the longest amount of time. How do I, how do, I want longevity in this piece of equipment. What can I do to ensure that same thing that you would have for a car or you know an HVAC, a standard air conditioner, you have to follow certain maintenance procedures and those are covered in our training as well. So in addition to all of that, we just, as a company, um, we are really, we understand that our farmers' success is, is very indelibly tied to our own. And so um, people like myself, and uh, other people on the crop research team. We do create a lot of information that we share with our farmers. Um, so some of the stuff I mentioned before about um, planting spacing, etc., as well as the you know ideal recipes that you can use in order to grow. That's all information that we'll share with our farmers gladly. And we'll also have uh, you know meetings and consultations to go over how to improve what you've already done. So all of that together really just kind of speaks to the full freight farms experience. Awesome, great answer. So just quickly going back to the crops, um, somebody asked, does it do uh, the crops grown in our farm or hydroponically last longer than traditionally grown produce? Because I don't know what traditionally grown produce you're referring to, well, all I can tell you is how long our crops last. Um, because I feel like that speaks for itself. Generally speaking, your a head of lettuce when it's harvested with the root ball on, which is one of our, our kind of really claims to fame here is that you're keeping that root ball on the plant when you harvest it, which keeps it alive. Um, you can keep your plants fresh and in the refrigerator in an airtight container for two, sometimes up to four weeks and still have them be fresh and saleable. And I know this personally because I actually ran a farm with my brother for multiple years. Uh, we sold to restaurants and multiple times we would have them call us up and say, I found a bag of your lettuce in the back of my refrigerator. Uh, it was three weeks old and it still looked like it did the day you brought it in. So this is a, this is a really common story, a common thread that we hear from people and really just speaks to the, the longevity of the lettuce and other leafy greens as well. Yeah. And just to add to that, typically your customers or who you're selling to are going to be right in your backyard. So they will experience the same. Um, you know, I can, if we were selling to someone down the road, Dave could harvest all of that right now and take it to them the same day. So they're going to experience that same shelf life that uh, Dave just talked about, as opposed to receiving lettuce, maybe from a different state or anything like that, because they aren't being grown in your own state. Absolutely. So, Food miles are drastically reduced because of that too. Absolutely. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the air circulation because we got surprisingly a lot of questions about that and just how it works and everything under that umbrella. Awesome. Um, so that's another kind of key feature that I, uh, I forgot to mention here, but is really, really cool about this farm. So I'm going to show you once again that wall in the back of the farm. That is basically where the HVAC system lives. So our large air conditioner what it's doing is it's drawing in air um, on the upper part right there. That's the warm, humid air that it has. It's absorbed heat as it's moving way, its way back. That air is actually, the cold air from the HVAC system is ducted underneath the floor that I'm standing on right here, all the way to the front. It comes out through these grates. These grates here are the exhaust point for that cold air. It then gets pushed up, hits the ceiling, and then hits this fan above me. This fan then pushes that cold air back towards the rear of the farm, right over top of those LEDs. So it's absorbing a lot of the heat from those LEDs as that cold air makes its way back 
where it's pulled in by the HVAC system again, and it is cooled and dehumidified. And then all the water that's collected from that air, as I mentioned, goes right back into your tank. So the air system here is very much a circle. It goes from the back, under our feet here, to the front, through those grates, up, hits the ceiling fan, runs back to the back of the farm again. So it's just a massive circle. In addition to kind of our primary airflow here, we also have secondary airflow through these ducted grow row fans, which are effectively fabric sleeves with these very purposely cut holes in them. And when I turn these fans on, which I'll do right now, when I turn these fans on, what you're gonna see as they fill up, these air gets expelled through here. The larger holes are pointing towards the top of the panel because it's just further distance for it to go. So each one of these holes is designed to equalize the airflow over the canopy of the plant here. So these are pushing air, cold air from the, basically from the back of the farm over these plants evenly. So that's distributing that air and trying to basically make sure that these plants have the airflow that they need to transpire. So there's a couple different air flows going on in the farm. I'm going to turn those off to just a little bit loud. But that is, those are the kind of primary air flows going on in the farm. Awesome. And what temperature do we keep our farm at? Generally around 70 degrees during the daytime. So that's when the lights are on. And then about 65 degrees at night. That's for leafy greens, a lot of cool weather crops. If you're going to grow something like basil, um, you would set it to the basil recipe. That's going to be a warmer temperature setting. Other things like Malabar spinach, for example, or some other herbs tend to prefer a warmer environment and will actually grow faster in that warmer environment. So most, most of the time it's around that 70, 65 range. Um, but for warmer crops, we'll bump it up to 75, maybe even 80 degrees, depending on what we're growing. And uh is there any additional heat required when outside temperatures are extremely cold like negative 40 celsius um or anything like that so not required no uh if this hvac system in the greenery s does come with a heating coil excuse me and that can be used to heat the farm if absolutely necessary but the insulation of the container is, is it's very well insulated and as a result the air temperature inside the container is really well maintained also, the LEDs in this farm give off a fair amount of heat, and that helps keep the temperature in the farm definitely well above what you may think the temperature in the farm would be if the outside environment were negative 40. So it does help keep the heat inside the farm. Rarely do we ever have to use that heating coil, but it is there. This HVAC system, by the way, is um, made by a company called Northern Air Systems and it is really designed for industrial and military applications. So it's extremely robust and it's designed for extreme environments. Awesome. So we have about five minutes left, so I'm just gonna keep plugging away at these questions. Um, we are getting more and more. I think we have over 200. So let's talk about farmhand. Sure. And how that works. And specifically somebody asked, do you offer crop management software? So yes, farmhand, the, and as I mentioned, once you get your farm online, you have access to all of these cool features and, and kind of crop management software and things like that. We have a feature within farmhand called crops. Crops allows you to virtually lay out your entire farm. It allows you to basically, you have a certain number of sites in your seedling table. You have a certain number of sites in your cultivation area. You can virtually plant those it will also, depending on the plant that you choose when you are planting out your farm and crops, it will basically give you an intended harvest date. You can also track your harvest data. You can track your, your even you can even track your sales through the crops feature. We're constantly adding to it. We're constantly updating it and just trying to make it more usable um, for our users as well. So. Absolutely, we have crop software and we'll continue to develop it over the years to come. Um, right now, it is, it's really just in its infancy and it's still really powerful. 
Yeah, and I just put a link into the chat with our farmhand booklet. So definitely take a look at that. And in the email that goes out with the recording, we'll definitely send all these resources that I'm putting in the chat. That way you have time to capture them and really read through them if you need. Um, let's talk about maintenance. We got a lot of questions about saturation strips and uh, do you have to replace it after every harvest? Sure. So the saturation strips, we recommend that you replace after every three to four harvests, um, specifically for leafy greens or shallow, kind of shallow rooted plants like lettuce, uh, where the, the root system isn't as developed as something like kale. But usually after every three to four harvests, which ends up being about every three to four months. So every three to four months, we recommend you pull out the wicking strip or the saturation strip, um, clear off any root debris, wash it, and then reinstall it. So that is, these saturation strips can be used multiple, multiple times. I mean, we have farmers that are still using five to six year old saturation strips and they're still still performing. So they're really, we haven't seen the lifespan of them just yet um, as a whole. So saturation strips do present a piece of that maintenance task uh, or that kind of maintenance agenda, but they're not a large piece of it. Um, but they are a fairly large task once it rolls around every three to four months. Normally though, we're talking about cleaning filters. So there are filters on the different pumps in the system. So we have three pumps in our seedling tank, and then we have an additional three pumps in our main tank. Each one of them has a filter on it. Those need to be maintained. We also have HVAC maintenance. Um, so this is kind of standard. If you have a, an AC unit at home, you know that that should be serviced on a regular basis. We recommend the same. We also clean our tanks out every four to six weeks. So we'll flush out all the old water, put in fresh water. That allows us to kind of start from scratch, make sure that we start out with the right nutrient ratios. Like I mentioned earlier, nutrient ratios are really crucial when you're growing hydroponically. So you want to make sure those are maintained as well as possible for the long run. Um, other than that, there are kind of other small items. So the, the gutters that the tanks or that the panels are hanging above need to be cleaned on a fairly regular basis. They can accumulate some algae over time. Um, algae is just kind of a ubiquitous part of growing in hydroponics. Anytime there's light and water, as well as nutrients, you're definitely gonna get algae. So you have to control that. We also recommend cleaning solutions, um, hydrogen peroxide specifically, which is a really common additive in most hydro commercial hydroponic applications where that will be added directly to the water, the tanks, it can also be used as a cleaning product for surfaces. Um, and then, you know, kind of, I would say more miscellaneous items along the way, but I think I've covered the most of them right there. Awesome. And we had someone ask a question in the very beginning about our peat moss plugs and if they're a sustainable option or are there any other substitutes or anything like that? Sure. So. The, the plugs that we use are actually not 100% peat moss. They're a peat moss and cocoa coir blend. So they are about, I think it's about 50, 50. Um, let me pull out one of these as an example. So they are just a blend of peat moss and cocoa coir held together with a food grade binder. So these ones are kind of our standard option. We know that they work. So we, we feel very comfortable recommending them to our customers. Um, now that is, there are lots of different options out there and not every farmer uses these, these kind of peat moss or cocoa bar plugs. Um, we have farmers that use rock wool. We have farmers that use oasis cubes, which are more of a foam based. Um, we also have farmers who use a gel, which is a, a new interesting one that's coming on the market. There are a lot of different options out there for how to start your seeds. But basically, it's important that you have some kind of substrate for your seedling to grow in to support that root growth as it starts to develop. So no, you are absolutely not beholden to growing just in these peat moss plugs, but they are probably our most researched and um, one of the products that we feel most comfortable recommending. Awesome. And one last question, um, the grow panels. Yeah. Can you, uh, well, the first question is, how many grow panels are on one wall 
And sure. um, the the grow racks itself, is it sliding or can you just touch on that really quick? Sure. So anyone out there who can tell me how many panels are on each wall gets a virtual high five. All right, anybody? Yes, Don Stevenson and Shaitan Shaitan, both of you, high five. All right, so there are 22 on each wall. So that's 88 total in the entire farm. Um, so they are about a foot wide and there are a couple inches in between each one. So there, these, each one of these grow racks is about 25 feet long. Now they are built onto what's called a um, rack and pinion system here. So we have this handle within this little encasing here. We actually have a belt can kind of show you inside of it. You can't really see, but there's a belt inside there. So there is a gear here. There's a gear at the top and it sits inside of this little rack. And as you can see, there are some teeth there. So as I turn this side to side, you can see that rack moves, those teeth engage. And that is what moves these grow rows side to side. So they are manually engaged by moving this handle. As you can see, we've got three of them here. This one is this the mobile light wall, so it's much lighter than the others. And then as you can see, we've got this far left one as well. So they are not particularly hard to turn. Um, I'm not straining myself. It may look like uh, I'm, I'm not using any energy at all. There are There is a little bit of force that you have to put into them, but they are not difficult to move, um, especially once they're fully calibrated. Alrighty. And with that, we are at time. Like I said, there are 131 questions that I, that we weren't able to get to. Um, so like I said, we will have your accounting executive reach out to you, follow up with your questions. Please uh, just keep submitting them and keep the questions coming because um, we want you to be happy, satisfied and full of knowledge about our containers. But Thank you, Dave, for your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It was great seeing all the engagement and everything like that. And uh, have a great evening or day. Mm -hmm.